everybody. We're going to take a look here at a very important topic in econometrics uh, and regression analysis, uh, and that's the issue of the endogenous regressor and how to deal with the problem using instrumental variables and two-stage least squares. So we're going to go through enough of kind of the, the theory of the issue to motivate an example that we will execute in Stata. Uh, so obviously there's a lot more to the issue than we're going to cover here, uh, but just to get the get the basics going here. So imagine we have a regression equation, right? We're trying to explain variation in our dependent variable, call it y1, with variation in two uh, independent variables, call them x1 and somewhat ominously y2, right? So we might think of our little causal diagram here. Some of the variation in y1 will be explained by x and y2. Some of that variation will be unexplained by those variables, so that'll be attributed to the error term, our ui here. And that's kind of the, the normal kind of gauss markov assumption of how a regression works. But all too often, there's going to be some form of correlation between that supposedly random error term and one or more of our regressors. So here are those red arrows uh, indicating either a, a simultaneity issue, a random shock to that error term affects both our dependent y1 and independent y2 simultaneously, or, I guess I should say, and or, uh, there may be a reverse causality effect, right? Uh, so if either of those cases are present, we have a correlation between our y2 regressor and that error term, and any ordinary least squares coefficient estimator is going to be biased and inconsistent as a result of that. So, what are we going to do about this? Given we have a regression of this form, so we're assuming that the x1 variable here is exogenous, uncorrelated with that error term, but that y2 is the problematic endogenous regressor, a non-zero covariance with the error term, so the hero of the story is going to be an instrumental variable that we will label z, which is external to our regression, so it's not uh, an independent part of that explanatory power. And for this to work, it has to have three specific properties. Right? A number one, it has to be exogenous, uncorrelated with that random effect error term determining our y1 variable. Uh, there has to be at least some correlation, some overlap between this new variable z and that problematic y2 regressor. And then lastly, like we said, this z variable has to be external to the regression. There can't be any independent explanatory power between z and the dependent variable, that y1. So partial y1, partial z should be zero. So going back to that little causal flowchart diagram, the role that this instrumental variable z is going to play, we can see here, right, so same situation, trying to explain that variable y1 with our x and our y2. The y2 is going to result in uh, that endogeneity bias, so we need this z variable. It's going to be correlated with y2, so that's that little yellow arrow there, but no independent relationship with the error term or with the y1 variable. If you needed another diagram to think about that, uh, we can kind of sketch this out as a, a little Venn diagram where the circles here are hypothetical representations of the variation in these variables. The y1 up top here, the y2, and then finally the z in green down there. And we're imagining right that this variation in y2 right overlaps with y1 we've excluded the x variable from the discussion here for simplicity and that overlap areas b c and d right well that's going to represent our explanatory power right the covariance between y1 and y2 but we're imagining there's this little slice call it area b up here that represents this endogenous component so it's simultaneously variation in y2 and variation in the error term, which otherwise would be 
just represented by that area A variation in Y1, not explained by Y2. All right, so now we can kind of see how this instrument, this variable Z, is going to operate. It's going to be correlated with Y2, so there's going to be this overlap, F and D. It's not going to overlap with Y1 independently, right? so it's not eating away at that error term. But there's this, the way I drew it, a very small, but there's this slice, this area D, that represents variation in Y2, explaining Y1, and correlated with Z. So this is going to allow this Z variable to act as a, a little scalpel, right? We're going to be able to slice out the problematic variation in Y2. Because we know if Z is uncorrelated with the error term, then anything that overlaps with Z will also be uncorrelated with the error term. So that overlapping explanatory power, F and D, by definition will exclude the area B, which again we're imagining is the, the problematic, isolated, uh, endogenous component. Okay. So again, not, not a mathematical analysis, but not a bad way to think about what's happening here. So real quickly, the mathematics of it how do we derive an estimator based on this external instrument? Well, rather than doing a direct least squares estimator, right, we would do a method of moments operation, right, where it's all based on this critical condition that the covariance between our z variable and the error term is zero. So the expectation of z minus z bar times u minus u bar is equal to zero. Now it's just a matter of some algebra, right? We plug in the definition of u and u bar, so the variation in y, not explained by y2. And again, for simplicity, we've excluded the uh, exogenous x variables here. So we're imagining we're only trying to explain it, explain y1 with y2. And then you go through the simplification, solving for the resulting coefficient b1, and that's going to be our iv estimator which is going to come down to the ratio of the covariance between z and y1 relative to the covariance between z and y2. So essentially what's happening is z is partially replacing the variation in y2. What we can see from that diagram, right, is that it's excluding the problematic variation, right? the variation that contains that endogeneity. And when you put it side by side, put this IV estimator side by side with the OLS estimator, you can see exactly that, right? So OLS in a simple single regressor case at the population level would be that ratio of the covariance Y1 and Y2 versus the variation in Y2. And again, we can see that a, a portion of that variation in Y2 has been excluded. Okay, last part here. Uh, like I said, we're going to look at instrumental variables and two-stage least squares. Uh, oftentimes, those are used interchangeably. Essentially, they're going to get you to the same place. Um, but the two-stage least squares is kind of the mechanical version of that of that estimation. It's actually even a little bit easier to see the intuition of it. So the setup is exactly the same. We're trying to explain y1 with a y2 and an x. x is okay, but the y2 variable is correlated with the error term. We're imagining, you know, the hardest part of this in real life is finding a variable z, but for the mathematical purposes, imagine we find a variable z that fits our criteria. It's exogenous. It's correlated with y2. It's external, excluded from the original equation. So step one, or stage one of two-stage least squares, is we estimate this equation where we take y2 and explain it with z and all of our other exogenous variables, in this case, say, our x1. So we run this regression, y2 as a function of z and x1, and we save the predicted values, the fitted values from that regression, call it y2 hat. Again, think back to the, the diagram. This is going to be the portion of the variation in y2 that overlaps with z and x1. And since z and x1 are both exogenous, 
any variation that overlaps with them will also be exogenous. So now we're going to replace the full variation in Y2 with its fitted values from this first stage. And that's the second stage. We simply do that little substitution back into the original equation, where Y1 is now explained by X and Y2 hat, which by definition will be exogenous. So we could do the math again and show that these two are going to be exactly equivalent. They will be. The two-stage least squares estimator done mechanically will exactly match that method of moments estimated uh, instrumental variable coefficient. Okay, so now, how do we do this in Stata? Uh, so we're going to use two uh, commands not to do the estimation, but uh, just to look at it and to, and to get the data uh, that are not part of the standard uh, Stata package. So to get the data, if you haven't done it already, uh, you're going to type in ssc install bc use. Uh, so this will give you access to the Boston College repository of data from the Wooldridge Econometrics textbook. Lots of data sets in there. Definitely install this. Go to the help menu. Look at all the, uh, the data sets. Um, obviously, if you're working with that textbook, it's going to be crucial to have this. Um, but just so many uh, example data sets to play around with. Uh, and the other one is you're going to want to type ssc install e-s-t-o-u-t est out so this will make it nice and easy to put our regression output into tables so we could look at the the output side by side okay and the data set we'll play around with here one we've seen before uh, is going to be a wage data set as a function of things like education marital status uh, job experience etc uh, so we'll type in bcu's wage 2 and there's our variables and imagine we're doing something like this right we want to run a regression with individual level wage as a function of education and work experience right and now let's kind of scroll back in our slides here and think critically about you know, the role of these variables right and it's highly likely we're not going to prove it here that'll be the next video of testing for this condition but we should be very suspicious about this education variable right so what are the characteristics in the error term right what affects an individual's wage other than their education level and uh, work experience, well, it's going to be things like, you know, unobservable talent. How hard working are you? Uh, how diligent are you? Uh, do you have kind of family connections, right? Well, those things will all help you succeed in work. They're probably also going to help you succeed in school, right? So people with positive error terms are probably going to have higher levels of wage and higher levels of education. So there's going to be this non-zero covariance between y2 that's going to be the education variable and the error term so in other words we should be very suspicious of the coefficient here on education it may be coming from a biased estimator so again in in real life this is where you're going to be stuck once you kind of identify a potentially problematic endogenous regressor now you got to scour your data set for a variable that can act as our, our z variable, right? That's going to look like this, something that may be related to your education level, but won't directly affect your level of wage in this example. And a random shock to your wage won't affect this variable. So in this case, we've got a pretty good possibility here. The number of siblings, S-I-B-S, sibs, uh, that an individual has we can be pretty confident is going to be reliably exogenous right a random shock to my wage today isn't going to affect the number of siblings that i have right it's going to be literally a pre-existing condition right it's pretty much written in stone at this point but we could also imagine that it might affect there might be that little yellow arrow that it might affect your resources available to your education right if you're an only child, well, 
Maybe your parents can spend a little bit more, send you to graduate school, send you to college, where if you're one of 10 kids, maybe you don't have those resources to spread around. So there's likely going to be that yellow arrow. And again, we could, we could test for that. But for the purposes of the example, let's say we've, we've settled on that number of siblings as our instrument. Now, before I estimate the instrumental variables regression, let's store this OLS output. So we'll type in ESTSTO estimate store OLS. All right, that way we can put it side by side with the instrumental variables. Now, instead of the command here is just IV reg or IV regress, and it's going to look just like we had wage experience but we're going to put our education in parentheses and set it equal to the instrument. Education equal to SIBs within the parentheses. So notice what we're not doing is just replacing education with siblings, right? That's not what instrumental variables does. So this command will call up right, that method of moments estimator behind the scenes, and this is the value that we see. So quite a bit different from the original OLS coefficient. Right? So there's anecdotal evidence of bias here. Uh, again, we'll formalize that in a follow-up uh, tutorial. And let's go ahead and store this as well. ESTSTO IV. Uh, and then just to walk through it, how to estimate that mechanical two-stage least squares estimation. Well, the first stage, right, is just going to be OLS regression, but the dependent variable is going to be education as a function of Z, our siblings, and the X variable. We want to put in all of those exogenous variables, so we'll put in work experience here as well. And then we want to save the fitted dependent variable here, so we'll go predict education hat, and the default is the, the fitted dependent variable. And then the second stage, Again, we don't use IV regressor, we just use uh, OLS with wage as a function of experience and education, but it's the fitted education from the first stage regression, so education hat. And let's go ahead and store these variables as well. So this is 2SLS. Oh, didn't like that, sorry. That's already taken. Let's call it ESTSTO two stage. And then, since we only have three models that we've stored, we could call them up individually. We'll just type in ESTOUT, and it'll put them all side by side. And the whole point here is that the coefficient on education is exactly identical in the IV and the two stage least squares case. It is worth noting, something we didn't cover here, that the standard errors, the t-stats, and the p-values are hypothesis testing, are going to be a little bit different between the two. And that's because the IV regress command uses the appropriate calculation. Some adjustment, adjustment would have to be made for the mechanical two-stage least squares. Uh, so unless there's a really good reason to, uh, which may be something we'll cover later on, you would just go ahead and use that IV regress. Okay, so hopefully you found that helpful. Probably raised more questions than it answered. Um, so definitely dig into this topic uh, in your textbook, uh, and we'll look at some testing options in the next video. Thank you.